We are glad to have you joining us today for a really important and timely conversation on Section 230, a wonky but critical part of how we solve many of the harms that we're seeing emerge from Facebook and Google, especially now. To start this conversation, we are pleased to welcome Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky uh, from Illinois, who has been a leader, a progressive champion on many issues, but is also the chair of the um, Consumer Protection Subcommittee in Congress and has been looking at Section 230 closely for a very long time. So just to set the scene a little, um, you know, in recent weeks, we have seen... Um, kind of Something the, just happened here. You're still here. You're good. You can still see me? I can't see anybody. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, we've seen kind of questions about the fundamental power, market power of platforms like Facebook and, Facebook and Google and the kind of social harms and destruction that emerge from their kind of clickbait business model, which is kind of supercharging and amplifying toxic, false, racist, dangerous content throughout our social discourse. And so what we're thinking about and looking at, and we released a short report this morning, which you can find on our website, um, is how we really address these problems at the root, uh, rather than taking a symptomatic approach to some of them. So we're really pleased to be able to welcome Congresswoman Chikowski at this timely moment to share some of her thinking about Section 230, what we should, how we should change it, and um, talk a little bit about the politics of it going forward as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to the Congresswoman. She's gonna speak for a few minutes. We'll ask some questions, um, and then we'll turn it back over to Dave Dan, who's going to introduce our panel of Matt Stoller and Karen Quambly. Congresswoman, thanks. Well, Sarah, I just wanna thank you so much for inviting me um, to be here. The title of today's event is absolutely perfect. Um, Section 230 and making social media safer for democracy. Um, and it, it, that's really what is at stake right now and what we need to talk about. And actually, it's pretty hard to um, think about even um, why the, the tech industry is doing what it's doing. But I think the answer is clear that they have a different agenda. It has to do mostly with money. And um, they, what they need to understand is that this really is existential. Uh, platforms must be made safe for our citizens, as voters, as consumers, as advocates. And it's hard to really think of, an, of uh, any one of them that's doing enough. And rather than grappling with the enormity of the, uh, of the challenges they face, they're looking to um, further entrench their power by tucking 230 now into trade agreements for all over the world to protect the, uh, anything that they want to do internationally as, as well. In March, David Cicilline, Congressman David Cicilline and I sent a, a letter to our colleagues on the Appropriations Committee um, instructing them or asking them actually to restrict the United States Trade Representative's ability to negotiate and to enforce this provision of NAFTA II, the uh, Japan Digital Agreement, uh, and any further agreements. This is what they want to do is just tuck it in there so that it would be harder for us to make any domestic changes to 230. Um, and given um, uh, congressional Republicans comments after the president's executive order, which we can talk more about later, um, I would imagine that they'd be enthusiastic partners on this, um, on this front. But up till this point, this has been an effort that's really been led by the Democrats. Um, credit to Ambassador uh, Lighthizer, um, since we sent the letter, to appropriations, he has taken very seriously our concerns with Section 230 and spoken to me at some length um, about the uh, on the matter. So, um, as so, but so long as 
this um, remains USTR's negotiate, negotiating position. We can't have um, substantive debates over how to reform Section 230 if we are going to export this to our trading partners around the world. So in terms of Section 230 as a domestic policy, the pro-230 community likes to talk about how it protects and uh, free speech. That's their, their, main, their main argument. Um, that is the um, policy goal that I share. Of course we do. But I don't agree that means that we can't or shouldn't examine how to amend Section 230, how to reform it, and to make it fit with America's needs and our democracy today. Um, because, um, because that's not how the law works in today's world um, online, um, in the online ecosystem. So, um, which this, this is the reason that we're all here today, and I'm calling on Democrats and Republicans and certainly on advocates to come together and say in one voice to Ambassador Lighthizer, stop exporting Section 230, um, which, which uh, of course, uh, it begs, really begs the question, what should we do to reform Section 230? Meaningful, positive Section 230 reform means we create a level playing field throughout the economy and we protect our democracy, which is looking more and more fragile um, these days. Um, to do this, we must draw bright lines that make clear the, uh, that commerce um, is not the same thing and should not be confused with speech, which often happens. Making money online um, is not the same and selling advertising is not the same as free speech. Paid advertising, uh, advertisements are not and never have been protected speech. So I like to call this solving the Airbnb problem because when Airbnb sued for neg was, uh, um, got sued for negligence with respect to fair housing, local zoning and uh, lodging laws, they claimed Section 230 immunity. They argued that in, um, in they argued in court that this is third party content, not commerce, and some judges actually listen to them. The, they argue that 230 allows them to moderate content, that is remove illegal um, posts, but, um, rental, uh, but renting your house and not, uh, is not speech, and 230 should not let Airbnb skirt the laws that hotels and others are required to comply with. In a society that seeks to protect consumers and to protect the public good, um, platforms cannot hide behind 230 to deny necessary legal protections to consumers. And I am stunned that American judges would actually provide, uh, would actually um, prove to be sympathetic to these rules. And a Airbnb is not alone. We had a recent um, situation, Facebook had done nothing to stop the sale of inclined sleepers. Um, this is something that the federal, the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission had deemed um, to be hazardous. Oh, um, almost 100 children have died from um, these inclined, inclined sleepers, um, and it was being advertised on Facebook Shop. And I sent them uh, a letter along with uh, Senator Blumenthal and Vice Chair Cardenas asking them to take down all listening, to take all uh, the, the listings down and stop selling these inclined, inclined sleepers. Um, they missed uh, the response date that we have, have asked for 
and they um, are continuing to advertise this really deadly uh, product. Um, and um, so we're, we're, we also must ensure our democracy is, uh, is safe to, from, from Facebook um, and recent, recent announcements uh, um, let's see, Fa no, Fa I'm sorry. Um, Facebook recently announced the um, members of its transnational um, uh, anyway, they, they, they now have a transnational independent uh, content oversight board. It's got a ridiculous name. Anyway, um, I assume that they did this to deflect from critics who say that the market that that Mark Zuckerberg alone should not be the arbiter of our uh, political debate, but there are no guarantees that this board is independent and cannot be overridden by Mr. Zuckerberg or others within Facebook. After we held our hearing on Section 230, which we did last fall, um, I appeared at a, an event that uh, a, 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 one evening with uh, Kara um, Swisher, I think many of you know who she is, and she asked me about the hearing. And before I could even answer, she said, quote, let me guess, you heard them say over and over again, it's really hard and we could, we could always do better. And I have heard, and you have heard these apologies or these excuses from Mark Zuckerberg um, for years and years, and bingo, she was right. Um, these uh, companies um, ignore um, subpoenas that have been issued um, by uh, democratically elected government officials, and they have more money than well, I think they have more money than, than, than God and are incapable of providing um, coherent terms of service that provide consumers and our, uh, that, that protect our consumers and our democracy. So we need to get some legislation. We need to pass legislation. And that means that reforming tech, Section 230, but it is not just Section 230. We must pass legislation that puts consumers and voters first and holds big tech accountable. This, is, this action is called for right now by all of you and all of us, and now we really need to get busy. So I thank you, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Hey, thanks so much. Uh, I think I want to start with the politics. So like a lot of issues in tech right now, the politics are not um, aligning in the same way that politics on other issues have been aligning for a long time. Um, I wanted to ask you about President Trump's executive order from a few weeks ago that kind of pushed this into the conversation, which we tended to consider um, more of a distraction than any kind of serious effort to work on this uh, problem. Um, but, af but after that, uh, you know, we saw Joe Biden come out again, he'd said it previously, and talk about the need to revoke Section 230 for Facebook. And we saw Speaker Pelosi also come out with a statement saying that this right. was something that needed to be looked at in a serious way. Um, and just yesterday, we saw a letter from four Republican senators to the, FC to the FCC about Section 230. I, I think there's probably a lot of curiosity about the politics of this specific um, uh, effort. Um, what, if you're optimistic about being able to work on this in a bipartisan way, uh, how also you know, the efforts by Lighthizer to embed this into trade agreements plays into that, um, I think some context in that would be uh, welcome. You know, well, first of all, let me, let me just say, in terms of the executive order, the president clearly, um, it's, it was a, a line where he um, wants to sue any publishers and he wants to take licenses 
uh, away. This, this was, he, you know, he was really, really acting out. And if you look at the executive order, it puts a lot of power in the hands of the attorney general, um, who you know is certainly not on our side and would side with the idea that somehow they, uh, what we're seeing online has been um, uh, skewed um, against um, conservatives and against the president, uh, president personally. Um, so I am encouraged about bipartisan support, however, um, when we had our hearing uh, on um, 2.30, um, the um, um, ranking Republican, along with the chairman of the Energy and Commerce Commission uh, Committee, Greg Walden and um, Frank Pallone, um, both indicated in a letter that this was no time for the trade representative to be taking this uh, abroad and tucking it into, into trade agreements. Um, there clearly is some bipartisan support for um, reforming um, 230 and another approach making, or an additional approach, making um, them live up to their community standards. But the very idea that when they have um, advertising, and, and we can think of any kind of political advertising that the president might say, with all kinds of misinformation um, in it, that the platforms have to take responsibility. They are, once, once they take money for um, that advertising, um, then they are really the representatives of those companies. They are making money from those and that they ought to, um, that they have to take responsibility. So I, I really do think that the, um, the, the politics is, is ripe now um, for having some bipartisan support to move cautiously. And as I said earlier, we are for free speech. The question is how do we, um, how are we going to define it uh, and protect it and still make sure that uh, corporations, you know, that we, um, Facebook has um, more than 2 billion people, which is larger than any country, as was pointed out by the woman Bickert, Ms. Bickert that was testifying before us. So we have um, a responsibility here to our democracy and to try and enlist bipartisan support. I think you raise a very important point that's integrated with the conversation about their business model and their advertising business. And that is um, their market power and the fact that now Google and Facebook control uh, what billions of people see and the news that they consume. And then when you marry that with kind of a surveillance and targeted advertising based business model, you have you know, a real recipe for democratic crisis. And you know, what we have seen is Facebook and Google are essentially harvesting revenue away from uh, traditional types of publishers who are providing local content that helps hold policymakers accountable and provides a real service to the communities and our democracy on the whole. And then at the same time, these corporations are kind of harvesting that revenue and then amplifying kind of the most divisive, the most toxic, the most engaging content and harvesting um, ad revenue right alongside that. So one of the things that we talk about is a need for kind of a regulated competition approach where uh, consumers have choice. They are not locked into necessarily using Facebook. It's become really an essential way to communicate, to connect with your children's school or coworkers. Um, you know, deleting Facebook is not really a viable option, nor should it be either as a way to, to um, catalyze policy change or to kind of protect yourself. Um, it really, I think, is, is up to our policymakers to, to um, um, neutralize the negative impacts from market power and then the really toxic, incredibly lucrative business model. So my question for you is, uh, in terms of kind of their ad business and how Section 230 mm -hmm. allowed them to develop this advertising business, um, while kind of claiming the mantle of free, um, how do you think that that should evolve in the future and going forward? What should kind of social platforms like Facebook, which are um, essentially monetizing this clickbait and causing all of this range of harms, um, turn towards in the future? 
Well, I mean, I, certainly I think there's the question of, is Facebook just too big and should be made smaller? But that's really not the, the question that we're um, focusing on, on today. I think that um, we, we need to look at what, what are the, the tools that both allow for um, free speech, but also limit the um, power of, uh, uh, of Facebook um, to um, avoid any kind of liability, any kind of responsibility, um, and to um, and, and, and so I think the uh, you know one thing is of course to go right at um, Section 230 um, itself, which we're, we're going to definitely be having conversations about. And one uh, and the other way is to to or part of that is to say that they are they re are required to. Um, o obey their own community standards. And when we say that, the president has one view in, in mind of what standards are, um, but we, I think, need to set up a, a policy, for example, that would um, include things like um, have um, rules that have to be accompanied by clearly delineated um, sanctions um, that can be imposed that the companies should publish these clear um, and precise rules that um, that they have to uh, that they have to be held to, and the rules must be precise and um, contain clear metrics. Um, and there has to be some sort of an, an appeal process there. So I, I mean, I I, I think that um, rather than leaving even this international group that's going to be overseeing uh, so-called um, overseeing um, Facebook is internal. It's seriously not enough and that we have to some ha have these outside standards that regulate what it means for them to um, advertise on, online and what kind of content uh, and what kind of um, commerce they're be able they're able to profit from without any real regulation or responsibility. What do you think that I think there's a lot of people from the kind of advocacy community on this call? Um, kind of going back to how Section 230 is is being embedded in trade agreements. Like we've seen that the impacts of kind of Facebook's and Google's business models are not limited to the US at all. You know, we're seeing um, uh, kind of incitements to genocide take place, incitements to violence, um, this sort of, um, you know, social disruption and attack on democracy through, you know, various platforms, WhatsApp, um, Instagram, Facebook, et cetera, is a global phenomenon. So yes, we saw, you know, we heard uh, Facebook has apologized uh, for contributing to the genocide in Myanmar, um, you know, um, but that's what we get. We get, oh, we're really sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we've heard we've heard some apologies a, a few times. Um, <laughs> uh, and then I think we can also look at at some of the impacts on publishers and news, right, uh, internationally as well as in the U.S., where you know you're seeing more fragile democracies uh, who uh, who sort of ability to kind of cultivate uh, a free press is being essentially squashed by um, the presence of, of Facebook in those countries. So I think we, um, we were really concerned with um, how the NAFTA was renegotiated and how Section 230 was embedded in that. But I, you know, how can kind of advocates step up to bring uh, more pressure to bear on some of these questions which seem you know, very wonky and kind of hard to, to perhaps organize some of the energy around that, you know, does exist around Facebook. Well, I think, you know, the fact that I understand there's at least 500 people that are listening today, that the advocacy community around these questions is growing and growing, as well it should, because um, these platforms have become such a part of our lives and our ability to function in society today that that the while it seems wonky and obscure we're all we're all using in some way every day and especially now and this at this moment 
um, the technologies that they have capitalized on. So I think that especially among among younger people and um, a, and effective advocacy groups, that this is the moment. This is absolutely the moment. And I think there is definitely uh, a, an audience. There are allies, as you were talking about, the traditional um, media. There are, are certainly, um, I think, a coalition that is active and, and coming together. Um, it's going so of course, members of Congress are important and we want to make sure that we engage as many members and maybe on both sides of the aisle, we hope. Um, but that's only going to happen from with the with the outside um, pressure. And you know, when you're talking about um, uh, Facebook and how enormous it is and getting bigger all the time, um, it, it's 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 a serious battle. This is a serious adversary. Um, and so um, I think you know what you're doing and what you're doing today and the organizing that's going on is the essential component. I believe as a organizer most of my life, I believe in the effectiveness of the grassroots and the um, advocacy groups. Great, Congresswoman, uh, th this is David Dayan with the American Prospect, how are you? Um, I, I, had a, I had a question about this uh, Section 230 uh, situation with uh, respect to the, the trade agreements. I, I first wrote about um, uh, uh, Section 230 being placed in NAFTA in July 2018. So there was about a year and a half where we knew that this was coming. Uh, and, and was embedded in the deal. I know you were working on negotiations with uh, Secretary Lighthizer on other parts of the bill and, and that the House Democratic Caucus was working on it. Did this come up? Was it, it just did not seem to be a major part of the debate at the time. Uh, uh, how, how, you know, what was the level of understanding or, or, or salience to that uh, at the time when this was all being negotiated? You're absolutely right. I was on a working group and it was divided into labor, enforcement, environment, and pharmaceuticals. So I was uh, on the pharmaceutical um, part of it and was successful in keeping out patent exclusivity, which Big Pharma wanted in the bill, but there was not really a focus. You're absolutely right. And I wish we had all read your article in a timely way because um, it, there really wasn't a focus. Um, it came in late in the in the game um, and you know talking to and my argument at the time that it came in um, was um, that there is a there is a conversation going on in Congress right now about 230 and there is this is not a moment to enshrine it in um, uh, trade agreements and and so you know it should just you know, at least, at the very least, wait for Congress to have the conversation that we are beginning right now. Um, and um, so I, I, I'm sorry that it wasn't one of the, um, you know, that it, that it wasn't in there from the start. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and uh, with respect to the, uh, uh, your, your effort now to get it, uh, uh, you know, to limit funding for it or implementation or to uh, talk to Secretary Lighthizer. Once it's in the deal, I mean, I, I assume it's harder to uh, uh, try to make these maneuvers and, and, and essentially nullify it, but how successful do you think you can be with this effort and, and what can people do to, uh, you know, assist in that effort? Yeah, well, I mean, that, that, that the goal has to be to make sure that it, it doesn't get in there. Lighthizer likes to say this has nothing to do with Illinois, Illinois, that has nothing to do with national law, the U.S. law, that we, you know, we can still do what, uh, what, what we want. Um, and, but, mm. but I, I think that is not really the case. I think there's no doubt that it makes it harder for us to, uh, to change the rules. So it's, it's very important that we focus on not internationalizing this um, liability shield for, um, you know, for, for big tech. And um, I think this is definitely a, a moment to act on, on this. All right, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Congresswoman Schakowsky. Any, you have any last words for us? 
you know, it's going to be organizing. It's going to be speaking out. It's going to be all the fine work that, that you are doing. It's going to be contacting directly uh, members of, of Congress. Um, all the strategies that you know so well about how to move an agenda have to come to the fore right now. This is a critical time. I think it's really a transformational moment in the history of our country. I'm seeing um, people, everyday people being more and more empowered. But this issue, I think you're right. You call it wonky. I think it's easy to, to have that under, uh, uh, not as obvious as some of the other fights that we're in right now like for racial justice and uh, police accountability. Um, but it's equally uh, important ultimately to our democracy to focus on this. So please stick with it. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. All right. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Dave to okay. uh, moderate our panel with Matt and Karen. All right, great. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, thank you to Congresswoman Schakowsky for uh, uh, bringing that great information for us. Uh, so we're going to have a discussion further about these issues. We have uh, two excellent uh, people to discuss them. Uh, first, we have uh, uh, Karen Kornblue, uh, who is currently a senior fellow and director of the Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative at the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, also was uh, 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 a, a top official in, in the Obama administration. And uh, we have uh, Matt Stoller, uh, a research director of the American Economic Liberties Project, author of Goliath. Uh, everybody knows Matt. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I'm gonna start with Karen. We're gonna do a, just a few minutes of, of uh, discussion, uh, comments on, on this issue of uh, Section 230. Uh, then we'll, we'll bring in some questions. There's already some people uh, uh, putting in questions uh, into the Q&A uh, from the audience. So uh, we'll, we'll go right to that. Uh, but Karen, uh, if you want to get us started, uh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. I've been having some Zoom issues. Um, so thanks so much for having me uh, to the American Economic Liberties Project and the American Prospect. Um, I wanted to start by taking a step back, uh, given where we are right now and what's going on in the country, and take a look at how very dangerous the current situation on social media is to American democracy, but beyond that, to our national security and our physical safety. So yesterday, the president uh, tweeted out a story that's been spread by a conspiracy theory outlet, One American News, uh, written by a journalist who also writes for the Russian propaganda outlet Sputnik about a 75-year-old man who was injured by police actually being a member, he's claimed, being a member of a far-left group, Antifa. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign is running ads saying, stop Antifa. And on Facebook, uh, there are these groups numbering in the tens of thousands. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of groups, but they're in included among them are these boogaloo groups, groups of, of folks who think that there should be some kind of uh, civil war, they're anti-government, pro-Second Amendment. And all of this together has some real world consequences. Two of three men charged with plotting violence at a Las Vegas uh, protest participated in one of these boogaloo groups on Facebook. Um, until June 5th, Facebook was still recommending boogaloo groups to people who were in similar kinds of groups. And people across the country in small towns are apparently arming themselves against a supposed Antifa threat even though AP and Reuters today came out with stories that showed that none of the arrests having to do with the protests have anything to do with Antifa. They're mostly uh, alt-right or militia types. So we just put out this report on um, how to safeguard digital democracy. And what we wanted to take on was this idea that the answer is that we want the platforms or the government to do more censoring or more deciding on what's true. Then instead, uh, the real issue is that the platforms allow voter manipulation. There are all these loopholes in the way they're designed, the practice, well before you get to the final piece of content that allow voter manipulation. So in this example that I just gave of what's going on, we have outlets 
that have none of the traditional features that you uh, know of and, and have come to trust about something that has a certain font and calls itself an outlet um, that look exactly the same and are distributed exactly the same as traditional outlets that follow certain transparency. You can flood the zone of uh, the day's news on Twitter with a coordinated campaign. There's personalized propaganda where you can take data, surveil people online, collect their data, target them with exactly the message that's going to spur them to action. There are these private groups that you know, outsiders can't get into very easily. And then there's this uh, moderation. The moderation happens in two ways. We think of moderation as happening after the content is up and deciding whether or not to take it down. But there's also the moderation in terms of your newsfeed that you may think that your newsfeed just shows you everything that somebody you follow uh, posts in the order in which they post it, but it's actually amplifying the most conspiracy oriented, um, outrageous, because that's what's going to keep you online and serve you ads. So they're programming your newsfeed almost as much as a broadcaster would program the evening lineup. And then there's the moderation at the end where they decide who to, who to apply the terms of service to, how to enforce those, et cetera, which is very opaque and inconsistent. So, um, so we, we lay out three things, then I'll turn it back over to you. Um, how to reduce the noise of disinformation, how to increase the signal of real information, and then accountability, which I think is what we're mostly talking about today. So decreasing uh, the noise, um, we think we have to update a lot of offline laws, consumer protection laws, civil rights laws, privacy, national security, practices. Um, and I know there's some skepticism in the report that you all did about regulation, but I, I'd, I'd love to have that conversation because I think we need to revisit the whole concept of regulation and um, outgrow our pessimism about it. Um, on the boosting the signal of real information, we think there should be something like a PBS of the internet funded in a sort of super fund tax way by taxing the online ad revenue of the platforms to fund some kind of civic architecture and then accountability. And uh, this is what we're talking about today. So things like interoperability, this is huge. If you have a PBS on the internet, but it can't reach anybody, what good is it? Um, if you wanna to decide to join a different platform and you can't get to it. Uh, data sharing, it's really hard for anybody to know what's going on in these platforms. Uh, so nobody can monitor it. Nobody can really figure out, you know, the ad database that um, Facebook and Google keep, they both, had huge glitches right, coincidentally, right before the UK election. Um, and then 230. And I think looking at 230, and I, I, the one thing I'll say, which might be a little provocative in this setting, is I think we have to be so surgical and so careful. I'm so nervous about the EO, the executive order, and I'm very nervous about the Earn It Act. And I think if we're not careful, we're giving an opportunity uh, for a Nixonian kind of government, if they wanted to, to just muck around and use their muscles to um, tell platforms to cover them more favorably and others less favorably. So we have some ideas for some really surgical approaches, but I think I wanna expand the conversation include other, other aspects of accountability as well. All right, great, Karen, thank you. And, and hopefully we'll get to some of these points uh, uh, during the discussion. Uh, I do wanna turn it over to Matt now for some brief remarks, uh, and then I need to get a phone charger. So uh, Matt, thank you. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, okay, so I was going to say something nice about Dave, but he's not there, alas. Um, so Dave's been pushing this notion for a long time of ban targeted ads, and that's essentially what we want to do. We think that's the, the way to fix a lot of the problems that we're seeing. So uh, Karen's points about how social media has real spillover effects into the, uh, into the offline world is important. The internet is a dumpster fire right now. Um, you can see, you know, we're talking about police violence and, and, uh, and systemic racism, things like that. But you can find conspiracy theories like George Floyd's death was faked. The, you could find conspiracy theories that, you know, George Soros is providing bricks to protesters and, you know, all sorts of things about it, Antifa. And, uh, you know, that, that's a, these have significant consequences in, 
one of the more important ones is that we're just not living in the same factual universe. And a lot of the sharing of this, of this information is happening on the two dominant platforms, Google and, uh, Google and Facebook. Uh, it also happens you know, in, in other areas, but largely it happens on platforms that have a business model of selling online behavioral targeted advertising. Now, we don't have to look uh, to the past for a system that doesn't have these problems. We can just look at podcasting. You just don't see the same kinds of divisive um, uh, racist content on podcasting, or at least you don't see the same kind of clickbait advertising model on podcasting. And I think it's important to ask why that is. So I'm gonna make three simple points. First of all, changing the behavior of Google, Facebook, and ad tech firms is really simple. It's about how changing how they make money. The second point is advertising drives the internet. And the third point is advertising is driven by and protected by this law, which is really a public benefit uh, and subsidy to um, specific uh, ad tech firms called Section 230 of the Telecommunications Act. So what is Section 230? So Section 230 is a specific public benefit to companies that run uh, to platforms that lets them not be liable for content by the people that use those um, platforms, even if the platforms themselves are filtering it or editing it or selling advertising next to it. It's in, in other words, it's a public utility style law. And it was written to pr protect filtering in chat rooms uh, in the 1990s. Now, one analogy here would be phone networks. If I am talking to you on, you know, through AT&T or Verizon, AT&T and Verizon are not liable for what I say. The difference here is that I'm paying AT&T or Verizon for the actual public utility service. Whereas with the platforms, uh, you're not actually paying direct money for the service they are actually distorting the flow of information through advertising. So they are given these public benefits of a public utility law, but they're not actually making money like public utilities. And that's a conflict of interest that's really causing a lot of the dysfunction that we're seeing. So, um, so they make money from illegal and racist content. Now there's a lot of questions about the right way to censor or how to get Facebook to do a better job doing fact checking or whatnot, but we don't actually have to go that far to figure out what to do. As an example of the problem, Google recommended Alex Jones's content 15 billion times on, on YouTube. Um, the reason is because that kind of divisive and racist content under our current online advertising model, which incentivizes clickbait, is profitable. They make money spreading divisive content. And you're not going to fix a system like that by telling Mark Zuckerberg to censor better. You have to change how they make money. Um, so how does podcasting work? How do uh, traditional uh, advertising works when you have libel laws, the sort of the pre-2006 internet or the, or the pre-internet days? Well, it worked through something called contextual advertising, not online behavioral targeted advertising, but contextual advertising, which says that we're going to advertise to audiences there was there's some direct uh, advertising as well, but mostly it was saying we're going to advertise to audiences that are developed through a relationship or trust. And that's the kind of uh, business model that we want to get back to. So the way to fix that is pretty simple. It's uh, you just say that Section 230 um, protections simply don't apply to institutions that make money through online targeted behavioral advertising. And that will force Google and Facebook and a lot of other companies to shift away from intrusive surveillance and advertise, uh, intrusive surveillance and tracking um, and, and targeted advertising back to contextual advertising. It'll create a relationship of trust, the kind of relationships that existed on the internet pre-2007 and the kind of uh, situation that we see right now with podcasting, which is a pretty good and diverse media ecosystem that isn't subject to this same disinformation and nonsense. Thank you, Matt. And, and despite me being away, I did hear the compliment because I always like a bat signal hear compliments of myself. Um, uh, I, I want to bring Karen in on that because that's really an interesting way of stitching together this notion of targeted advertising and uh, Section 230. And, uh, you know, looking at the business model rather than 
trying to very surgically, as you say, police uh, certain types of speech or certain types of content over others. Uh, what do you think of this idea uh, that, that Matt has uh, uh, put together? So, uh, you know, obviously the, um, the entire internet has changed since Section 230 was written, since the quote unquote self-regulatory model uh, was rolled out for this infant industry. Uh, it's way more centralized, as um, you all know better than anybody. Um, uh, it you know filters everything through a um, through an algorithm and so on. So it's really changed. And I don't think anybody writing Section 230 uh, thought that it was going to apply to this kind of commercial speech that um, uh, was was designed and um, uh, distributed by so it's it's about third party content on the platform whereas these ads are sometimes designed by the platforms they're certainly targeted by the platforms uh, you use their whole back-end system so I think it's really intriguing to look at that nexus because you could argue so easily that that wasn't part of the original conception it wasn't the way the internet was working then and I think behavioral advertising is creepy to a lot of people. Uh, Senator Warner in his white paper um, likened the way you're tested on when you're online and um, to see how you react to certain things is like the way research subjects are tested, but we don't have any of the same ethical guidelines that we do for, for researchers uh, experimenting on human subjects. So I think it's a really rich area. My caution about 230 in general is that, um, uh, it doesn't do as much as everybody hopes it's going to do on either side of the debate. And I know Matt's going to come back on, uh, at me on this, but um, uh, we, we have a paper that Ellen Goodman wrote that's on our website that I really recommend to everybody. Um, and what it talks about is the fact that if you get rid of, two, so let's say the platforms kept their targeted advertising, but you got rid of Section 230. Um, you get a lot of frivolous lawsuits, you know, and, and Barr has already said to the plaintiff's bar, you know, go at it. We're going to change 230 and we want you to be the enforcers. So a lot of frivolous lawsuits. And it's not clear because we have such weak libel law in the U.S., because that's all 230 is. It's about whether or not you can sue folks. So it's not clear that the, some of the disinformation that we're both talking about is defamatory in a way that would hold up in court. So I think that's, that's where it gets you know, really exciting for us nerds, really boring for probably the 500 people listening in. But I think it's a, it's a rich nexus and it's, it's, it's worth thinking about that. Public knowledge has proposed something else, which is that maybe 230 shouldn't apply to the ads. But I think that's different. I think that's less ambitious than what Matt's talking about. So I don't think it'd be a substitute for what he's proposing. Well, that's interesting because actually we had a question about that, about is, is there a legal distinction between, for what example, Facebook users post versus advertising that is paid for uh, on, these, on these various platforms? Uh, you know, I, and I think there's some differing questions about that. Um, so, uh, Matt, maybe, uh, I mean, I think we're having a good discussion here. So, Matt, maybe you could respond to uh, what, what Karen just said. I mean, yeah. It I don't think that section changing section 230 fixes everything. Uh, that's not, you know, one, one of the things that we put out in our paper is, is we believe that you also need to engage in a series of, of uh, structural separations for these, for the platforms, which are dangerous centralizations of power regardless. So that would, you could do it through regulation or antitrust or statute, but you also want to, you know, when you have those component um, sort of the children of Facebook and, Google per se, uh, you want to set market rules so that they compete uh, in ways that that build a better society instead of competing to divide us and um, and incentivize uh, racism and all sorts of you know conspiracy theories and antisocial content. I guess the general my general sort of observation is that smaller institutions tend to do a better job at uh, moderating, uh, you know, you, you have a, a company like Yelp, which has, you know, is much more focused and aggressive about rooting out uh, spam type of reviews. I mean, Yelp's not perfect. They have a lot of problems, but they're much more aggressive about rooting out spam type reviews than say Google. Um, Google's 
competitive product. And that's simply because Yelp is focused on that. And I think that part of the reason that Google can, you know, just get away with lots of just random crap and making money off of it, things that are just not true, is because they're, they're, they're given this government benefit of a, of a liability shield. And it's not the only reason, but that's certainly one of the reasons. And so, you know, part of what's happening is Section 230 is an incentive for, for um, bigness, for absentee ownership. And we shouldn't, you know, what we're seeing writ large across our society is absentee ownership. Like the Mark Zuckerberg doesn't have to bear the cost of the things that are going on the, at the edge of his network, you know, because he lives in Palo Alto. He's going to have a fine life. He doesn't have to deal with the, you know, the various dysfunction that he's causing. But also Section 230 creates a, a legal shield so that his institution isn't liable for it either. And so I, I think that that's a benefit that we've given to these companies that they shouldn't have if they're making money off of the dysfunction that they're causing at the edge of the network. And there are a variety of tools that we should, you know, we can use to address that. But I don't, you know, I think changing Section 230 and moving us away from this targeted intrusive advertising model would go a long way towards addressing it. Yeah, I think you're seeing that in a parallel fashion when you think about things like Amazon, which is really using 230 to get around the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I mean, they're, they're, they're using it so that they don't have to necessarily uh, adhere to right. the uh, consumer standards that are the, of the products sold on their network. I mean, I'm, I just want to mention that I'm, we're seeing a lot of questions from, from the audience about, you know, how does Europe do this and, and lots of other ideas. Why not use privacy law? Why not do these other, you know? And I think that the basic idea, I don't have, I'm, I'm agnostic on the particular legal tool to use. The fundamental problem is that you have, uh, you have control without responsibility in these platforms. Right. And you can deal with it through Section 230. You can deal with it through privacy law. You can deal with it through antitrust regulation statute, whatever. And in Europe, they're going to do it in a different way, usually more passive aggressively. But the, 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 base, the basic problem, uh, the basic problem is that you have a separation of, of control and responsibility. And when you have that, you always see these kinds of social, social dysfunctional problems. You always see racists and trolls and con artists and scam artists using various things like, you know, in, in, it depends on the, the platform and the historical context, but you always see the same kinds of behavior. So it's about re restoring control and responsibility, a fundamental aspect of property rights. Right. Uh, I, I, I want to bring Karen back in because uh, we did have a question in the Q&A about elaborating on this, this public option that you bring up, this uh, <clears throat> idea of like a PBS of the internet. This, uh, it, it, the question was, you know, would serve as a social platform uh, plus news, but be more monitored or, or how, how do you really envision that? Yeah, so we're, uh, what we put out, we call a roadmap because we're hoping to convene a lot of people and talk to a lot of folks about how to specify a lot of these. But the idea would be, um, just like on the broadcast side, there was this big debate that resulted in the Public Television Act where they decided, we're, you know, we're going to have, um, I mean, not only CPB that designs content, but there's spectrum that's given to public broadcasters to distribute. Um, and we have a whole, you know, there was this idea that um, people weren't getting the information they need and there needed to be another way. Now, that didn't mean that the broadcasters weren't regulated as this report, that as the economic uh, Prairie's uh, project goes through. I mean that there was a lot of regulation on the broadcasters themselves, but the idea that you would have um, some space for a source of trusted information and news, I think, is one that we want to think about a lot. And what some folks are thinking about. So Ethan uh, Zuckerman, uh, formerly of MIT, is working on a whole project that links that to interoperability. So how would you make sure that if you had this kind of public information, civic tech, uh, uh, that you could link it in? There are a lot of other people looking at this idea of local journalism. How do we fund local journalism? And if all the ad dollars, as, as Matt is fo rightly focused on the advertising, if, if the ad dollars that used to go to support your uh, local news outlet have now all moved over to a few big platforms, how do you capture some of that? How about a tax? We call them sin taxes. You know, Superfund fee is another uh, analog. How could we tax that? And then, of course, the question is, you know, exactly how would you take that 
money and give it to uh, news outlets without having the government decide what's a worthy news outlet. So a lot of people are thinking that through. Could there be some objective standards? Could you do some kind of uh, tax credit that would be probably too widely available, but at least you wouldn't have the government deciding you're worthy and you're not. So there are a lot of us focused on thinking through some of those details, but something has to be done. I mean, the coronavirus has been called you know, an extinction event for local news. And, and all these conspiracy outlets benefit when there's this total vacuum. Uh, and advertising is just does not seem to be the revenue model that's needed, I don't have to tell you, uh, for news and information. I'm let me take issue with that because I think it's important to focus on podcasting, where, uh -huh. which is the counter, the, the direct counter to that. I mean, you absolutely see an ad driven model. That's with true. Speakers, and the reason is because it's a decent, so far, it's a decentralized yep. um, market structure where the advertisers, the producers, and the distributors are all in separate buckets and there's no targeted advertising. I mean, this is changing, right? Which is, which is dangerous. Spotify is doing a bunch of things, but, but I think it's important to recognize that there's, you know, nobody funded, no, the government didn't fund the creation of the podcasting world, right? We don't have to, you know, we, um, so we don't have to uh, think about, like, I, I, it's always tempting to say we need, you know, more PBS funding and, you know, I, you know, I like public <laughs> TV, Big Bird, that's lovely. Right. But you know, the, I think there is a, we have to think about how dangerous it is to tax targeted advertising revenue and then move that to favored political media outlets. And that's a real risk here. So I'm not somebody who just says, hey, let's, let's, we need public subsidies. Public subsidies might be good in the context of a diverse set of revenue streams, but we already have something that works really well, podcasting. Let's protect that. Let's also look at the fact that podcasting works a lot like the pre-2006 internet when you saw a flourishing of a whole bunch of different media outlets um and and you know we we can go back to that this is just about changing how these guys make money i mean that's this is there's no there's no secret here we don't need to you know go into like lots of super techie stuff like they make money by stealing from publishers that's why you don't see any new publishers really forming except in areas that are outside of where these guys operate so if we just stop them from stealing from publishers by getting rid of this that targeted ad model, you're going to see an incredible flourishing of, of content. You're going to see people building businesses around exposing police violence. You're going to see people, build, and you don't see that right now because there's no ad money for it. But that ad money is just in the hands, that ad money is going to inflating property values in Palo Alto. It doesn't have to do that. I, I, I do generally agree with that, although I would say that, that the largest podcasts, uh, uh, podcasts in the United States come from NPR. Um, but uh, uh, let's let's just so so maybe there's a sort of merging of these. The market is right there, but also there is there is a public option. Um, a, a lot of the questions really fall around, uh, uh, and and we just have a few minutes left. But really around how we're sort of back backwards announcing or, or backwards uh, looking at placing, you know. 2000 era or 1990s era, or in some cases, even 1930s era telecommunications law upon this 2020 uh, era structure of, of, of the internet and the idea that that, that really needs to be rethought. Uh, if, if you were, if we didn't have these laws in place and there was the ability to just sort of uh, do a page one rewrite and, and, and think about this from scratch, uh, what do you think sort of would be the best format and approach to take there? And I'll just give you each a couple minutes to talk about that, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Matt, would you go first? I want to think about that. So you're saying writ broadly about our, all telecommunications generally, or just yeah? I mean, I, I, I mean, per, in particular with respect to online, because that's yeah. I, mean, I think I think the thing to understand is that the '96 Telecom Act, Section 230. I know there's a narrative out there that Section 230 was, you know, written and then subverted by the courts. I don't necessarily buy that. I think that it was all a libertarian movement that started in the late 1970s to get rid of traditional media regulations that emphasized decentralization and local ownership. You can go to the Radio Act of 1927. You can go to the the Federal Communications um, uh, the, the Communications Act of 1930, it's 34. 
um, you can go to the, the financial syndication rules in 1970. You can go back to the post office in 1791. America has always said we are going to decentralize our, um, our communication ownership. That's just what we're going to do. There are exceptions, but we've generally done that. And we just stopped doing that in the 1980s. And so the first, what you first saw was the creation of giant uh, media conglomerates, which you still have today that are not helpful. It's not like the, the existing publishers did a great job before the Iraq war. Um, and then you have, uh, and then layered on top of that are something even more dominant, which are these tech platforms. So what I would do is just go back to traditional rules and just be super aggressive about decentralizing media ownership so that, you know, as Revolutionary War Congressman William Finley said, uh, wealth in many hands is many checks. I mean, you want broad property, uh, a little bit of property owned by everyone. You want every niche community to be, have, to be able to finance their own media outlet uh, so that you don't have this kind of massive concentrated control basically by a bunch of white billionaires over what everyone else sees and does. All right, Karen. Yeah, it's a hard question. Um, I mean, I get, I'm going to take a little bit of itch. I hate to take issue with Matt because I'm I'm animated by a lot of his Do same it. goals and 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 emotions. But um, I, you know, having been there when the act was um, passed, uh, because I'm that old, um, there there was a huge deregulatory. Uh, moment and you know Gingrich wanted to get rid of the FCC completely and you know Republicans wanted to pass the Communications Act with you know no controls at all but there there was this idea that this new industry was going to provide competition to the big old monopolists in broadcast cable and telecom so I just want to slightly defend some of the people who were thinking those thoughts. That's not about 230, but that's about some of the other aspects. Now, the internet completely changed. And I'm not saying that the people who were there, you know, and I was in the room, but I wasn't, you know, a decision maker. I'm not saying that we shouldn't have all been able to anticipate where, I'm not excusing anybody, because obviously it didn't work out the way people thought it would, but the internet totally, totally changed. And at some point, you know, we needed to step back in and um, not wait until it's so late when we have these enormous companies with these enormous budgets. And we have a Supreme Court that's even more enamored of the First Amendment. So maybe we could have done some things earlier that are gonna be even harder now because so much regulation is viewed with skepticism by everybody. I mean, everybody's becoming, you know, First Amendment ideologues the way they already have about the Second Amendment. Um, and the Supreme Court is looking to undo regulations just based on the fact that there, uh, any of them are violations on people's uh, right to speech. But what would, I, what would I do in the middle? So like in 2010, when I was the ambassador of the OECD, we got a bunch of countries to agree to a set of internet policy making principles. And what we said is you want to have free flow of information across countries. You want to respect human rights and the ability of people to speak. And everybody should sign on to that. But that doesn't mean that individual countries shouldn't be doing things to protect consumers, to um, uh, protect privacy, um, you know, to do more on civil rights and human rights and intellectual property and so on. And I think at least then, if not way sooner, we should have done a ton more on privacy. I think it could have stopped some of what Matt's talking about. I think it'd be very hard to unspool that with privacy now, I think he's right. But then I think we could have done a lot to, to forestall some of the micro-targeted advertising. We could have done a lot more with consumer protection. I mean, think about the fact that this Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytica thing, they were getting audited by an outside auditing firm that didn't seem to catch what was going on. So I think a lot more consumer protection, a lot more activity. And then there were these mergers uh, that happened um, that have you know, in, in hindsight, have added to the concentration. So if I were to unspool things, I think those would be some things I'd look at. Great. Uh, well, I want to thank Karen uh, and, and Matt for joining us. And uh, I believe I'm kicking it over to uh, Sarah Miller uh, for final remarks. Yeah, I just want to say thanks to, I've loved this conversation. I think there's something about this particular problem that gets at a much bigger debate that's happening in our society, and that is what should be the role of the public sector? What things that we've privatized should we bring back under public control, and how should that be protected from abuse? And then what things that 
should be should be organized through public the public the private sector um, how should that be structured uh, to 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 promote positive social outcomes uh, to promote kind of decentralization of power and to avoid um, you know a continuation of a status quo that we're seeing today that is unsustainable and unjust. So this conversation about tech platforms, the role of the state, the risks of the state coming into this space versus how we can create more market-based accountability, you know, deleting Facebook does not work, pulling, you know, organizing advertisers does not work, right? The scale is just too massive. So how do we kind of figure this out as a progressive community? Um, both in the tech space, which is so urgent and critical, but more broadly throughout the economy, right? Which I think there are, are a lot of conversations happening kind of under that broader umbrella. So we're a few minutes over, so I will leave it at that. But we had uh, a really huge turnout for this entire call with people staying on the whole way, over 200 people. Um, so thanks so much and some great questions. Uh, we will do this again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.